Uh, hey, Robert. Hey, Ron. So another week of uh, mayhem in the banking sector, or, or at least a lot of uh, swirling stories and uh, a lot of people trying to try to figure out what happened and what can be learned from it. And so we thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about learning from failure. And in particular, in banking, the learning from failure often has to happen at the regulatory level, given the big, big role regulate, regulators and regulations play in uh, the banking industry and in, 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 in banking crises. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a principle of ingenuism is this idea that failure, uh, you want to learn from failure, you want to you maximize knowledge from failure. And the question is, can, does that happen in banking? Uh, does that happen among the regulators? So, uh, and, and of course, we have a long history of failure in banking, particularly in American banking system. Uh, so you'd think there would be a lot of learning happening. Um, so, Let's talk about kind of the the, the history of, of regulations and and the lessons learned, or not learned, as the case. Or may not be. learned, yes. Um, I think it's it's a really good point that in banking failure is something that regulars are going to focus on more than individual banks. Uh, you know, there's there's the idea of failure as a failure to get the desired result. Uh, and that happens sometimes because you make bad choices and sometimes it happens because the universe just doesn't cooperate. So if you're playing blackjack and you hit on 15, uh, there's a good chance you're going to go bust. Uh, but that doesn't make it a bad choice. In fact, it is a good choice to hit on 15 every single time, you know, absent some massive card counting. And so a bank failing like Silicon Valley Bank, it, it's not necessarily a lesson that has to be learned. Now, in this case, I think there is a lesson to be learned. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they could have known it in advance, but that is that uh, deposits in 2023 are a little different than they were 20 years ago or 40 years ago when we you know, faced other banking challenges. Uh, and so I think it's, it makes a lot of sense to focus on not what did Silicon Valley Bank do wrong because in a sense, they hit on 15 with zero interest rates. They had to decide how they were going to maintain profitability. They obviously made the wrong choices ex post, but ex ante, it, it made sense. And if interest rates have gone up more slowly, if inflation had been transitory, uh, we, we wouldn't, none of us would be talking about Silicon Valley Bank right now. Uh, but the regulators, the regulators, uh, well, it's a whole different animal. Uh, learning from failure requires both gathering information and acting on it which requires acknowledging mistakes. Uh, generally, centralized systems are very bad at this. Mm -hmm. It does not have to be that way. Uh, there have been times where banking regulation has been applied in ways that worked very effectively. Uh, and there are other areas, and our favorite example is always um, the this FAA's taking an active role in gathering information, disseminating it, and making sure airlines learn from it to improve airline safety. And now we have you know, over 20 years without a fatal, you know, major commercial airliner crash, uh, which would have been unimaginable if you thought about it 50 years ago. So it is possible that we could have good bank regulation, but it requires gathering information and acknowledging mistakes and then deciding what you're going to do about those particular mistakes. Uh, we could talk about where regulators have done well. That would actually be easier because it's a short <laughs> list. But Very, yeah. It makes a lot more sense to talk about where regulation has failed us because that's where the lessons are valuable. You learn more from your failures than from your wins. And, and the place that I would point to first is our system of deposit insurance. Yep, yep. And and there, I think that really the story is is um, uh, the SNL crisis is probably as good of a story as any to illustrate what happens. Uh, the, the the dangers of deposit insurance, the, the moral hazard that it creates. And then, of course, uh, kind of the, the response of regulators once the crisis happens and how they, uh, they, they adjust to it. it, it it's interesting because the, the, the SNL crisis is now ancient history, even though we still remember it, <laughs> which is a little spooky. Um, but uh, so many lessons were there to be learned, right? Right. 
rising interest rates, declining interest rates, the interest rate mismatch, mismatches between assets and liabilities, deposit insurance, what happens when you incentivize banks to take on high risk. And it seems like very few of the lessons from the SNL crisis were learned, and therefore we kind of have to remake the mistakes in a slight, every time it's a little differently, but um, uh, 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 you know, in, in different ways. So let's talk about deposit insurance because I think it stands at the core of all regulations. And in, in a sense, we have, once you get deposit insurance, government almost has to regulate because uh, they, they, they've, they've given you this guarantee and um, they have to make sure you don't take too much risk with it. Exactly. And that, that's a hidden cost of deposit insurance. Now, deposit insurance does have benefits. I mean, deposit insurance was created yep. to avoid bank runs uh, because by the very nature of banking, if depositors all ask for their money back at the same time, the bank fails, no matter how healthy it is, unless it gets support from you know consortium of other banks or from the government. There has to be something that stands behind any individual bank. Uh, and runs are very costly. They, they require that uh, assets be liquidated in a fire sale, but that's really a transfer of value where the buyers get a really good price and the bank gets a bad price and the bank goes under. What really is the, the deadweight loss, the total cost to society is that it destroys banking relationships and banking relationships have value. You know, if, if any of you are listening, think about, well, do I want to change my bank? The first thing you, your brain is going to say is no, it's going to be a huge hassle. I've just got too many things tied to that bank account that I would have to deal with. And that is why banking relationships are valuable because the bank provides really valuable services. Uh, and just switching to another bank, um, it's certainly possible and people do it, but it has a cost and it destroys some of that value. But of course, when a bank fails, you have to switch. And if a bank is failing and your deposits are at risk, you want to switch before it fails. And that's what is, is really at the core of bank runs. And it was actually at the core of Silicon Valley Bank's run. Um, Silicon Valley Bank had a massive amount of unassured deposits. They were banking VCs and startup companies that raised tens of millions of dollars. You know, there weren't a bunch of $250,000 accounts that were covered by deposit insurance. Uh, and that's really the conversation now is what you would do about all of these uninsured deposits. Deposit mm -hmm. insurance handles small accounts and that's what it was designed to handle. Originally, it, it was a, a low level and, and for a long time, it had been raised to $100,000 um, in the, the thrift crisis. And then it was raised to $250,000 in the financial crisis in the and, late and 2000s. Uh, but that's that's just kind of raising it to keep up with the general rise in price level or the GDP or whatever you want is trending up. And so that Somewhat. level is still yeah. for relatively small accounts. It doesn't fit the profile of a Silicon Valley bank uh, depositor. I mean, the logic, part of the logic originally for deposit insurance was that you know people are too unsophisticated to be able to tell whether their bank is doing well or not, uh, you know, and, and particularly uh, people who are middle class and below or, or too unsophisticated. So we want to protect those people. Rich people are sophisticated or they can hire people who can advise them. Businesses are sophisticated so they can hire people to advise them which bank to hold the deposit or not. And uh, so the, the threshold was originally pretty low to cover, I'd say, middle class and, and, and poor people and, and not to cover the wealthy. 250,000 is already getting to, uh, you know, this is a checking account, so it's your saving account, is already getting to a level where it's a little bit, um, it's a little high if you're just trying to protect the so-called ignorant. But the reality is it's difficult to tell whether a bank is a good bank or a bad bank. And the market really, because of regulations, I think the market really hasn't developed a communication mechanism to tell us that. That is, there's no rating agencies for banks. There's no, there's no private uh, 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 solutions to uh, what well, we have are regulations, and and we we allow the regulators to basically tell us which banks are good and which banks are bad. If they exist, they're good because they're being regulated. If they if they don't exist, then obviously they're bad. Uh, and and we become totally dependent. I think I think the marketplace becomes totally dependent on regulators, and uh, it it dumbs us down in some way. Um, it, in, and nobody really is interested that interested whether the community bank is a is a, is a is a good bank a viable business or not? 
Yeah, that's definitely a problem. Um, the capping of the deposit insurance, which makes me really not want to call it insurance because insurance, it's really flipped around. It's, it's a guarantee. It's a limited guarantee, except when it's not, which turned out to be the case at Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, that having a cap is a nod towards the trade-off between everyone having to worry about whether their money is safe in the bank. And you're, you know, as you point out, that might be ten thousand dollars for someone, but it's all of their money, so they would yeah. have to they would be worried about it. But it makes no sense for them to be carefully analyzing the bank. The, the cost is is fixed, and the benefit is proportional to the deposit balance. So two hundred fifty thousand dollars was an, an attempt to say we're going to get the benefits of deposit insurance. We're going to get the benefits of the guarantee. And we're not going to create extraordinary costs. That is, we're not going to create a lot of moral hazard because most of what a bank does is finance with deposits. And most of what any company does is uh, monitored and disciplined by their creditors. Yep. I mean, if you are an equity holder, you, you, are, you basically have a call option. You get a lot of the upside and you don't take a lot of the downside, but it's the reverse for creditors. So every time, you know, you uh, you hear the question, why did that company borrow so much? That's the wrong question. The real question is, why did the lenders lend so much? Because yes. they're the ones who had the, the incentive to keep things under control. Uh, and that would be the case for depositors. Depositors are the lenders in banks. So you have the need for depositors to play the role of creditors and also the need for monitoring expense, you know, costs, or, which are real costs and people worrying and people trying to get information and that those are in balance along with trying to keep the balance uh, between the need to, to impose discipline on banks and the, the desire, the real benefit to maintaining banking relationships. And so this is a complicated question. It's not something where you go and you solve a little algebra problem and you say, oh, well, this is the way we should do it. There are a lot of ways that you could provide this balance, uh, and what we have doesn't seem to be working very well. It didn't work well in the thrift crisis, and then the problem was quite different than today. It was uh, the regulators understanding that the, the thrifts were insolvent, the thrifts being unprofitable, and them having to the only logical thing for the thrifts to do was to reach for new businesses, not traditional mortgage lending, mm -hmm. but to do something that could get them out of the hole they were in. And regulators did massive forbearance. Uh, forbearance is when you don't close an insolvent bank. And you could legitimately argue that regulators were forbearing on Silicon Valley Bank in January. You know, the, the bank was insolvent it didn't have to recognize that insolvency under the rules, the regulatorily created rules. And that was intentional because everyone thought in January that Silicon Valley Bank's deposits were very stable. They were you know, strong relationship deposits. They were core deposits. Yeah, they were uninsured, but the bank was still profitable. There was no reason for depositors to flee. And then they did. So, and it seemed like that good relationships. I mean, these relationships with startups, it, it was an it was a, a connected industry. It turned out that was the weakness, but it looked like a strength at the time because Silicon Valley specialized and that these people were really committed to Silicon Valley Bank and there was some, some real relationship there. Exactly. And in a different structure, it, it could have been a strength because what we discovered this year is that uh, the way you get information in reality uh, in terms of a bank run is, you know, on a Slack channel or an email thread. And it's not something that is well constituted to have anything but a cascade. Either the cascade goes towards we're all going to take our money out because once everyone else is saying I'm going to take my money out, it's the only rational thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, or it cascades to, you know, we're just going to leave our money in because if everyone else is saying I'm going to leave my money in, then it's a perfectly rational thing to do. And I think that's actually why First Republic has to fail because arguably First Republic was in as bad shape as Silicon Valley Bank uh, in terms of consecrated uninsured deposits, um, big losses because of interest rates. Now, it wasn't actually in as bad a situation, but bad enough that you would have just assumed, I would have assumed that they would fall next. But that's very hard to predict which way the cascade goes. And unlike the all being all venture industry, First Republic is 
we've got a more diversified uh, deposit base. So it looks like they may survive this. But that that sort of arbitrariness, depending on whether you know Peter Thiel sends a tweet, uh, that that's exactly what you want to avoid in a well-designed regulatory system. So you know we had forbearance, and everyone's going to say we shouldn't have we should have closed Silicon Valley Bank sooner. But argue, you could argue just as easily that we should have not we should have had a system that didn't yep. end up with Silicon Valley Bank being closed, and. That, that both of those are legitimate arguments. And I, I find it interesting because I think it, we got, uh, you know, between Silicon Valley Bank and Signature, we got a microcosm of what happened with regulators in the, uh, in the SNL crisis. I mean, as you said, in the, in the 1980s, regulators tended to uh, do forbearance. They tended to let banks run, even when it was clear the banks were, were bust. They were zombie banks and they let them run and they let, to take, they let them take huge risks basically buying lottery tickets to get out of the mess that it was created during the 1970s. But then in the 1990s, but then they got, you know, then all these banks went bust because they had to go bust. That was obvious. And, and the regulators got accused of blame for the forbearance. So then in the early 1990s, in particular in California banks, I think, they started shutting banks too early. That is, before they were bankrupt, there was even a, a famous court case which ultimately investors won, um, arguing that their banks had been shut down too early, these were SNLs. You could argue they did the same thing in miniature uh, here by, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, probably they gave it some forbearance. But then Signature, it, it strikes me that they shut it down too early. Signature is like a 90s SNL and SV, SVB is like an 80s SNL. And, um, and, and if, if we think about regulators' incentives versus market incentives, it kind of makes sense that they would behave that way. Uh, yes, uh, until they realized what a huge mistake it was, because you know the message was was very clear, and you saw it in testimony this week. You know the yeah. chairman of FDIC is talking about, well, you know, Signature Bank it had a lot of uninsured deposits, and it could have been a threat to the financial system, and we weren't sure how they would do on Monday morning, so we just shut them down. Well, you know, if you're a, a bank investor or a bank depositor, what you just heard is if you have a lot of uninsured deposits, we may shut you down. And yep. they also, at the time, they guaranteed all of the deposits at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature. So they took on the cost, which you know they've estimated to be two and a half billion dollars in Signature and $20 billion in Silicon Valley Bank, because it was actually insolvent. Um, they, but they did not extend deposit insurance. They didn't extend the guarantee to other banks, uh, other than some very large, unique policy responses to support First Republic. So they're simultaneously saying, we might not cover your deposits, but we're going to do it in First Republic. So don't run on your bank. And it's such a mixed message that it was almost guaranteed to cause chaos. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why I think First Republic, the, they drew the line in the sand is that we're not going to let it fail, um, even though if now we're forbearing again, so we went, you know, we don't want to be accused, accused of forbearance. So we do a quick uh, shutdown of signature. And now we're going to have to forbear because quick shutdowns, particularly in this environment where there are a lot of uninsured deposits that no one was worrying about even a month ago, uh, that, that looks very risky for the overall banking system. Yeah. So, so uh, I want to get back to deposit insurance in a minute, but one other issue I think with regulations that, that this crisis brought to the forefront is some of this issue about diversification. I mean, one of the, there's a book by Calamaris, uh, I think a finance professor at Columbia, about the fact that the American banking system is fragile by design. Um, and that is its fragmentation. It's, it's small banks, very little geographic diversification. Um, and we have 5,000 banks in the US. Uh, no other country has as many banks per capita, per GDP as we do, and that, that indeed having geographic diversification or industry diversification helps you in crises like this. So yes, Silicon Valley might withdraw your funds from your bank, but maybe, you know, maybe uh, middle America industry doesn't, and you can somehow survive these things. Other banking systems around the world partially are less fragile because of that. The rules end up defining the game. So, you know, Silicon Valley Bank was not penalized for having an undiversified deposit base. It was not penalized for having interest rate risk. 
uh, and it was given significant credit for having treasuries on the mm -hmm. balance sheet, which created the interest rate risk, which created the depositor fragility. So if under a different set of rules, we would have had a very different outcome, both in terms of what Silicon Valley Bank looked like, and then possibly how depositors responded to the fact that you know, interest rates went up a lot in 2022, and banks generally, uh, banks and other institutions that were uh, asset insensitive, uh, they, they have taken a big hit. And so now we have the question in that environment, what is, in the, given the rules that, that people were playing under, which was zero interest rates and all the other things I was talking about, but you know, what, what are gonna be the repercussions in 2023, given that the rules have changed? So, um, so at the core of, of really all re bank regulations, I think in the U.S. or most of them, is deposit insurance, and uh, it, we've seen several crises now that you could argue, or to a large extent, because of deposit insurance, or, or at least driven by deposit insurance. What would be what would be some approaches if if regulators actually learned from mistakes? If if there was a learning process, what what would what would be some suggestions, recommendations in terms of how to reform the system uh, to at least try to avoid the next deposit insurance crisis, which I'm sure will happen? Uh, it does seem very likely. Uh, so a, a fair amount has happened since the 80s. Um, there have been additional bands of, of capital put into the capital structure of banks to increase the buffer between depositors and losses. Uh, we saw that very clearly with Credit Suisse where there was uh, $16 billion of a particular type of bond that got zeroed out when the, when the bank got sold because the whole, they were basically catastrophe bonds. You know, you, you think of catastrophe bonds being for hurricanes or earthquakes, but these were catastrophe bonds for a bank. If you something bad happens and your capital goes way down, these bonds just get zeroed out or they get converted into equity or they get something happens that helps in, improve or, or refill that equity buffer level. Uh, that's an idea that came out of the thrift crisis. And you know, the idea from an academics perspective was more that these would give you a signal. So we don't have ratings on banks, but we do have ratings on bank bonds. So if every bank has subordinated debt, then you can look at the subordinated debt and get a strong market signal of whether the bank is healthy or not. Uh, and that's been around forever, so that hasn't made the difference. Uh, the, the thing that I think is the most challenging is trying to get this balance that I was referring to before, because one uh, opportunity would be to just eliminate deposit insurance. That would solve the problem, and it would bring back bank runs at the drop of the hat until the industry figured out some way yeah. to avoid bank runs at the drop of the hat. I mean, you could, you could, you bank runs are unique in a sense, but that's a, cha the challenge of credibility is something that every company faces and financial companies have ways to, to manage this. I mean, people don't withdraw their money out of their Schwab account when Schwab is in the news as you know, having trouble with its bank, which it is. Uh, and so I think that the, uh, the biggest thing that needs to be reformed is either acknowledging that there has to be a, a solution uncovered by the industry themselves, or finding a way to introduce that same kind of feedback system where we can learn and actually evolve a robust regulatory regime. FAA has evolved, you know, zero. Uh, that exactly what that looks like is, is hard to know, but I certainly have opinions. Uh, you know, a, a deposit guarantee makes a lot of sense if you're trying to limit the monitoring costs for depositors and having it cut off at $250,000, it, it, like you said, it's probably too high. Yeah. Having zero coverage beyond that makes this not insurance. So it does give depositors an incentive to flee at the drop of the hat, to actually run on the bank. 
And you want to maintain that, but you'd like to make it a little bit less fragile, a little bit less impulsive. So maybe you would actually do insurance. The way insurance typically works is there are certain things that are paid 100%, like preventative care. And then there's some cost sharing so that the customer does pay attention to what's going on and, and to prices and is, is incentivized to be involved in some of these things. And then beyond a certain point, there's a cap on the losses. The, in, or in this case, in the, the cost, but in the banks would be losses. So. I'm going to throw out some numbers. I'm not attached to these numbers. There's no formula for saying these are the best numbers, but you might guarantee the first $50,000 at a bank. That will cover the vast majority of bank accounts. And then yep. you might guarantee 90% of the next $20 million, which means you know if you have a little more than $50,000, you don't have a whole lot of risk. But if you have, if you're a startup company and you have $20 million at the bank, you have real risk. And then you guarantee, you know, either 100% or 98% or something that that uh, effectively caps the the total loss to a depositor. Now, it's rare for people to have a billion dollars in a bank, and anyone has a billion dollars in a bank. Uh, I'm, I'm not too concerned about them finding a solution to uninsured deposits. Yeah. Uh, but the, this the first two thresholds are really important because it changes the incentives without gutting the incentives. So you're a startup company at Silicon Valley Bank. You've got 20 million dollars at the bank. You've got all your relationships at the bank. They've helped you with meeting investors. They've helped you with knowing your customer, all the bank regulations with anti-money laundering. They've, they've, you don't want to leave the bank. But if your $20 million is at risk, that means your startup is at risk. Your entire reason for existing at this moment in time is at risk. So you're going to go at the drop of a hat. Now, if only 10 or 20% of that money were at risk, that would still be a lot of money. You know, it could be a couple million dollars, it could be $4 million, you know, you pick your percentage, but suddenly if the bank were to be closed and uninsured deposits weren't to be covered and everything would go badly, you would lose part of your runaway. You would not right. see your company failing next month because you couldn't make payroll. So having some mix of deposit guarantees and then deposit insurance with effectively a copay makes a lot of sense to me. In particular, it makes a lot of sense because we have this massive implicit guarantee that rolled out for Silicon Valley Bank, rolled out for Signature Bank, where depositors actually don't lose any money. Yep. And so this combination of saying, well, you might lose money, but oh no, you won't lose money is sort of like you're trying to convince depositors to pay attention to what the bank is doing, but don't run on the bank. But not really. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't do anything about it. Yeah. Uh, and that's a stable equilibrium as long as you know everything is going well. But it, eventually, some there's some shock to the system, and it completely breaks down. The more traditional insurance approach is exactly what's trying to be accomplished by saying we might cover you, we'll probably cover you. Don't worry about it. Don't run the bank, but we're not going to guarantee. Is you you say you are going to take losses, and their losses will be capped. You know, there's, it's not going to be you lose all your money. It just vanishes overnight. And that's uh, that's along the lines of what they did in the thrift crisis, which is they didn't guarantee all deposits, but they did guarantee basically 80% of uninsured deposits uh, and said, look, if, if and if there's more, we'll give you more. Like right? When we wind the bank down, if there's more money, we'll send you more money, but you'll get back 80% immediately. And that kind of approach would really level the playing field in banking because you have this weird situation today where community banks tend to have smaller accounts. So it's mostly insured deposits. So most of this is kind of irrelevant. But if they grow and get more diversified and get more profitable and get more efficient, and they, then they move into the regional banking, which has lots of uninsured deposits, but no, ostensibly no unlimited guarantee. And then the other extreme you have, the national banks, the city banks and JP Morgan's and Wells Fargo and the Bank of America, where everyone has acknowledged they're systematically important. They have the full guarantee. They'll never be allowed to fail. Yeah. There's 100% deposit insurance. I, yeah, I mean, if the signature is systemic, then those guys are all systemic, systemic right? Absolutely. So, if you're going to guarantee yeah. signature, you're, you, I mean, who knows who you're not going to guarantee at this point? Because you're, you're already guaranteeing not just uh, depositors, but also investors in First Republic. Not guaranteeing a lot, but guaranteeing you know that they're not going to fail in the near term. Yeah. 
but, but from an ingenuous perspective, we have a real problem here because e even if we impose such a system, it's still going to be top down, one size fit all. And, you know, ingenuism tells us that what we really want is experimentation. We want different options for different banks. We want banks to choose different things. Let's see what works. Let's see what fails. And I don't think you can have that with a top down system. It's almost like what really we'd like to see is the development of an insurance market, a real insurance market, a private insurance market. The, and then different insurance companies might offer different products to different banks and the market would then kind of uh, develop uh, optimal scenarios for different types of banks. It's not clear that the same deposit insurance scheme should be with an SNL or a bank that focuses on mortgages and a bank that focuses on Silicon Valley startups. They might require completely different insurance type products. That's exactly right. And, you know, in theory, if, if the incentives are right, you can get that in a top-down system where the regulators acknowledge the need for gathering information, learning from it, providing feedback in an objective and effective way. Uh, and we know that because we, we've seen that in, unfortunately, rare cases. I don't know how you get the incentives correct here, but you do have a way to acknowledge the implicit guarantee uh, which is the only reason that I don't think we should just chuck deposit insurance is because you could say we're not going to insure deposits, but it's not credible. The next time there's a crisis, the oh, yeah. step in. So if we it, it would have to be it would have to be a complete shift in the whole system. You can't you can't, you can't you know tinkering is 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 really you know they've been tinkering for really this whole issue started with the Great Depression. So since the thirty three securities law, so. They've been tinkering for almost 100 years, and that hasn't solved it. You need a real overhaul. And it's never gotten ahead of the curve um, yeah. where you know, deposit insurance is evolving to reflect the risks that are in the system today as opposed to the risks that were in the system 20 years ago or 40 years ago. Yeah. But look, this, this idea of having it be real insurance doesn't preclude there being um, you know, basically insurance layered on top of that. And, and maybe you make it so that the first 50,000 is covered by the government, and then it's only 50% you know, beyond that. And banks have the opportunity to buy private insurance to augment that and give their customers a bigger guarantee uh, with the understanding. And I think 50% is too low because what you need is a high enough percentage that the government won't step in when bad things happen. So in this case, it would be the bank fails and the insurer fails. Yeah. Uh, now, if banks are failing and insurers are failing left and right, and you have a financial crisis, then you probably do something like TARP and hopefully it works out. But, you know, in a normal situation, which is what we're in now, you know, there are problems in the industry. There are always problems building up in the industry. A few banks, their problems were large enough, they need to be closed. Maybe there are more banks that will have to be closed, particularly if we get into a recession. And if we had a well-defined set of rules where the losses were manageable so the government didn't automatically step in and, and say, we're going to cover all the losses, if we didn't have an implicit guarantee, then the system would work much better, not only in that moment, but it would be allowed to evolve and you would see some market signals. You know, what, what's a bank paying for its insurance? Uh, these... That, and that is the key. You know, if we don't have a system that allows for feedback, you know, acknowledges mistakes, learns from them, provides feedback, and hopefully to the entire industry, not to bank by bank, but at the regulatory overarching level, then we could actually, you know, have a insurance system that evolved with the industry and precluded all but the most, you know, severe crises that are caused by you know, macroeconomic shocks or pandemics or things that uh, eventually may end up with a government response, but it would be the exception rather than the rule. And what we have now is that the government effectively steps in even when problems are small and manageable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, is there any is there any sign out there that um, that regulators are learning and that we might be moving towards a better system here? Unfortunately, no. Um, the, there's been no talk about how we're going to alter the regulations to reflect what we've learned in the last couple of months. 
there was some talk about raising the deposit insurance ceiling, which I, I think, you know, is if you're stuck in that world, that makes sense because it's been at $250,000 for 15 years. But uh, if you're thinking about how do we make this better, you're just doubling down on the same failed system. Yep. Uh, well, yep. When we'll know that there is hope is when we get an acknowledgement of what's wrong with the current system and, and we start seeing ideas for how we're going to make it better. And that did happen in the thrift crisis. There were reforms mm -hmm. and there were new, new approaches taken. And those have just, you know, we got whatever juice was in those. It was things like risk-based capital, which makes sense, mm -hmm. but it doesn't save you from a Silicon Valley bank. And if all we get is that, okay, now we're going to look at interest rate risk, but we don't really know how to measure it because we don't have, know what the duration of the deposits is, it, then we'll know that nothing is happening. But a system that is really looking at, okay, what happened and how can we design a system that is robust to these kind of this kind of evolution of the industry or these unexpected, I'm not sure you could call what you know, going off the zero interest rates at some point unexpected, but it would handle something new. Uh, and that's what yeah. we absolutely don't have now. And I don't hear anyone talking about for the future. Yeah, I mean, I fear that as long as we are, as long as we fear experimentation in banking, nothing will change. We're, we're, that, 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 that attitude change has to happen. And isn't that uh, crazy? You... Because when you when you regulate, you're usually trying to control risk, and what you end up doing is stifling innovation and experimentation and learning and evolution. And I mean, imagine if the, the... and ultimately increasing risk as a consequence. Exactly. <laughs> imagine if the FAA had taken a different approach and tried to do yep. a, a you know, imposed. We're going to make up a system for how planes are going to get safer. It, it would. I wouldn't want it. I wouldn't be flying today, most likely. Yep. And this is what happened in the nuclear power industry. They said, we're going to yep. make sure things don't change so that, that we don't have problems. And what they did is they got stuck with the old technologies and the old approaches and the, the you know, no learning and no evolution. Uh, and in a sense, we, we have a lot of that in banking. It just, there are other areas that have evolved and there's been innovation. So it's, it's cloaked. But the reality is the banking industry uh, has the same sort of fragilities that it's had for a hundred years. They're not going away. It means we're doing something wrong. And the only way to figure that out is to start trying to do different things, stop trying to prevent risks, but instead learn what are the things that are robust to more general risk. Yep. Maybe one day, <laughs> probably not anytime soon. Thanks, Robert. We never give up hope here at Ingenuism. No, we do not. We the keep... world getting better, not worse. Absolutely. Absolutely.